when we get to first samuel we're going to see the people crying out to god for a king here in the book of judges the people are realizing how much they need godly leadership ungodly leaders can cause problems and a lack of leadership can cause problems we see that all throughout the history of the world where when you don't have godly leadership you have a lot of trouble i mean look what happened when someone like hitler took over nazi germany it was a disaster after that look what happened when someone like stalin took over the ussr it was, or russia it was terrible after that and so it's so important to not only have a person with diplomatic and political skill but somebody with the moral character to lead the nation to do what is right and in judges we see ungodly compromise in the midst of a lack of leadership and it leads to a downward spiral to destruction and the people are learning along the way we need god we need to trust in him more than ever and here in Judges chapter 1, we're entering into a period where for the first time, Israel doesn't have somebody to lead them. Moses is gone. Joshua is passed away. Watch what happens when you don't have godly leadership to follow. Judges chapter 1. The whole book of Judges is about ungodly compromise with that when you don't have godly leadership but you also learn about the grace of god even in the midst of those times g campbell morgan says what we find out about man and judges is depressing what we find out about god and judges is wonderful on the human side it's a story of disobedience and disaster on the divine side of continued direction and deliverance several times at the end of judges it says in those days israel had no king each one did as they saw fit and we're going to see how that works out judges chapter one israel fights the remaining canaanites after the death of joshua the israelites asked the lord who of us is to go up first to fight against the canaanites well that's the right thing to do you ask god that's a good start Verse 2, the Lord answered, Judah shall go up. I have given the land into their hands. The men of Judah then said to the Simeonites, their fellow Israelites, come up with us into the territory allotted to us to fight against the Canaanites. We, in turn, will go with you into yours. So the Simeonites went with them. It's good to partner with others in going forward in faith. It's good to work with others so that they can share in your triumph through faith and trust in God. So if the book ended right there after three verses, I'd be like, yeah, there'd, there'd be nothing to be concerned about. But let's keep looking. Verse four, when Judah attacked, the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands, and they struck down 10,000 men at Bezek. Bezek in Hebrew means lightning. It was there that they fought Adonai Bezek, the Lord of Lightning. <laughs> That's the name of the king. And fought against him, putting to rout the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they chased him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Boy, that sounds pretty harsh. But that was a very common thing they used to do to military leaders so that they wouldn't be able to go out on the battlefield ever again and this and listen to what Adonai Bezek says in verse 7 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off have picked up scraps under my table now God has paid me back for what I did to them so they just did to him what he did to 70 other kings disabling them so that they couldn't lead their countries into war against them well they brought him to jerusalem and he died there he lived out the rest of his days in jerusalem verse 8 the men of judah attacked jerusalem also and took it now they're not going to keep it permanently by the end of the chapter i think the jebusites take it back 
or they resist them. But right now they take Jerusalem, they put the city to the sword and set it on fire. Remember that. Because in 2 Kings 25, after centuries of unfaithfulness to God, the Israelites are going to be attacked at Jerusalem. And the Babylonians are going to set the temple on fire. And they're going to do to Jerusalem what Israel did to Jerusalem when they first got in there. Verse 9, after that, Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites living in the hill country, the Negev, and the western foothills. They advanced against the Canaanites living in Hebron, formerly called Kiriath Arba, and defeated Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai. This is in the southern part of the Promised Land. From there, they advanced against the people living in Debir, formerly called Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, I will give my daughter Aksaw in marriage to the man who attacks and captures Kiriath Sefer. We read about this earlier. Othniel, son of Kanaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it. So Caleb gave his daughter Aksaw to him in marriage. So very early on, Israel is looking for brave and bold leaders to lead the next generation. Verse 14, one day when she came to Othniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. When she got off her donkey, Caleb asked her, what can I do for you? She replied, do me a special favor, since you've given me land in the Negev in the southern part of Judah. Give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. I think it was Charles Spurgeon had a sermon years ago showing how this story parallels prayer. That when Axel wanted something, she got her husband to get involved and ask, and then they went to the father, and the father graciously responded, and she went to the father on the basis of his kindness that he had already shown her. And that's how we can approach God in prayer, on the basis of all the good things he's already done for us. And we should have somebody else asking for us and with us like Axel did. So you can see this as parallel to what we should do when we pray. Verse 16, the descendants of Moses' father-in-law, the Kenite, went up from the city of Palms with the people of Judah to live among the inhabitants of the desert of Judah and the Negev. Well, so far it's not so bad, but now watch what happens. Verse 17, then the men of Judah went with the Simeonites, their fellow Israelites, and attacked the Canaanites. They totally destroyed the city. It was called Horma. They also took the Philistine territory. Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron. The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had iron chariots. What? Iron chariots are greater than omnipotence? Iron chariots are too much for God to handle? What is going on? Let's read on. As Moses had promised, Hebron was given to Caleb, who drove from it the three sons of Anak. You remember the Anakites? They were giants. They were the people that the Israelites were afraid of back in Numbers chapter 14. And Caleb said we shouldn't be afraid of them. And here in Judges 1, he's not afraid of them. And because they faced a fearful situation without panic, and looking to God, they were able to overcome. But, verse 21, the Benjamites, however, did not drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites lived there with the Benjamites. So they took Jerusalem, they set it on fire, but they couldn't dislodge the Jebusites. They had to live there with them. Couldn't or wouldn't? Let's read on. 22, now the tr tribes of Joseph attacked Bethel, and the Lord was with them. When they sent men to spy out Bethel, the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said, show us how to get into the city, and we'll see that you're treated well. 
It's kind of like the Jericho story in Rahab, right? So he showed them and they put the city to the sword, but spared the man and his whole family. That's just like the Rahab story. He went to the land of the Hittites where he built a city and called it Luz. But, verse 27, Manasseh, which is part of Joseph, did not drive out the people of Beth Shan or Tanakh or Dor or Ibleam or Megiddo and their surrounding settlements for the Canaanites were determined to live in the land. Well, wait a minute, this is not going the way God said it would go if you would trust him. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. They didn't follow Judah's example. They didn't take over completely. It got difficult. They saw the Canaanites were determined, and they were like, well, we're not going to get stuck in a long, protracted military conflict. They're determined, so we're just going to live with them. Verse 29, nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites in Gezer, but the Canaanites continued to live there among them. Verse 30, neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites in Kitron or not. Well, what's going on? They're not, this isn't fulfilling the promises. Verse 31, nor did Asher drive out those living in Akko or Sidon. Verse 32, the Asherites live among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land because they did not drive them. Out. Oh, now we're seeing. It's not that they could not. It's that they did not. There's a big difference between could not and did not. Could not means you did all that you can and it didn't happen. Did not means you didn't. When God said you should. Neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh or Beth Anath, but the Naphtalites too lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land. And sometimes Christians are that way with their sin. Well, we can't drive it out completely, so we're just going to try to coexist with our sin. We're going to have it and try not to indulge in it too much. And that's what we do spiritually speaking with our enemies, with, with our sin, with our shortcomings. That's what these people are doing militarily. Well, it's too difficult to try to drive them out. It's too difficult to take over. So we're just going to have to coexist. Verse 34, the Amorites confine the Danite. Well, wait a second. What do you mean the Amorites confine the Danites to the hill country, not allowing them to come down into the plain? Can you see the dearth of leadership here, You're, they're missing Moses and Joshua. He wouldn't be, they wouldn't be putting up with that stuff. And so there's always going to be ungodly compromise in the face of a lack of godly leadership. When it gets too difficult, you don't have someone to lead you and guide you and direct you. You're going to end up coexisting and compromising. Verse 35, and the Amorites were determined also to hold out in Mount Herers, Ijalon, and Shalbim. But when the power of the tribes of Joseph increased, they too were pressed into forced labor. So the Israelites are doing to their neighbors what the Egyptians did to them for over 400 years. Press them into forced labor. They're acting like the nations rather than a nation that follows God and Judah. Verse 36, the boundary of the Amorites was from the Scorpion Pass to Selah and beyond. And as you go to the beginning of chapter 2, we're going to see how God is displeased with the nation of Israel. The angel of the Lord went from Gilgal to, to Bochim and said, I brought you up out of Egypt. And then, but you, and you shall break down their altars and not make a covenant with the people, no compromise, yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? And then in chapter two, verse three, I also said, I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you and their gods will become snares to you. So because you made a covenant with them, you pressed them in the forced labor, 
you coexisted and compromised because of that, I'm not going to give you success. I'm not going to drive them out. And then all the Israelites wept aloud. That's Judges chapter 2, verse 4. Well, we'll get to Judges chapter 2 tomorrow. But, ma'am, you know, here's the...